Hello everybody, so for our series on material scientists and entrepreneurs and startup founders, we have the pleasure of talking to Jennifer Alice, Professor of Biomedical Engineering at Will Morai Institute at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. Among the numerous other hats she wears, such as that of Director of a Translational Fiction Engineering Center, she's the founder of a couple of startups, her most recent venture, Nigeria, and her previous company, Carpenters. We're talking with her about research, startups, and how to go from point A to point B, meaning how to make the transition between science and creating a company based on the work done in the lab. Uh, hi, Jennifer. How are you? Pretty good. Uh, can you give me a brief pitch about what the main product of your current company, Nigeria, is and what is its purpose? Sure. The current company, Ageria Soft Tissue, is um, working to translate um, a soft tissue reconstruction material. So essentially, we're extracting a matrix from adipose tissue and processing it using a lot of standard materials um, science processing techniques um, to create a, uh, an injectable material for reconstructing soft tissue defects. Um, <clears throat> so this... Um, was funded in the laboratory um, by the Department of Defense um, for repairing um, craniofacial injuries in soldiers. And um, we developed it, characterized it, and then when it came, comes to manufacturing um, and running clinical trials, um, that's when we translated it to um, the company. How much are you involved now with the business side of the company? Well, the company is still at an early stage, and um, so I'm playing a, um, a very active role in the company right now, um, essentially establishing our preliminary manufacturing protocols and um, scaling that up and um, running our first clinical trial. After, after that um, is when we have to think uh, about um, partnerships, uh, marketing, sales, and things like that, which uh, someone else will be much better in in um, in doing that. So at this early stage, I'm a much more active role, and then as the company grows, um, I'll take more of an advisory role. So in all these respects, do you feel that um, your work at at Algeria is very different from, for example, if you were working at um, doing the same thing at a large established company, but you have to wear the many hats, as you were saying. Yeah, so the, um, the general perspective of small companies is that um, you do a lot of different things. You have to consider manufacturing, you have to consider regulatory, legal, uh, clinical. Um, you get exposed to all of those things much more than you might in um, a large company. When did you figure out that there was a good opportunity for commercial exploitation of this discovery? Um, I would say that um, we decided that this was um, something that could really be commercialized relatively early on uh, because it's early on in the design process when we're trying to solve this clinical problem, we're working closely with clinicians. And um, as we're developing the solution and looking at um, the numbers with respect to clinical need um, and um, you know, how many people could really benefit from the technology, um, that's when you start um, focusing on the commercialization plan. And how long was the process from idea creation to the actual creation of the company? Well, that's hard to say because it's not so as it's if one, you know, one day this new idea comes. It's really um, an evolution of ideas. Um, and uh, so it's, it's been a couple of years. Um, IP protection, to, mm -hmm. to jump to a different subject. Um, sure. What kind of restrictions did it place on what you could and could not talk about with colleagues and conferences, for example, on publications? Well, I think um, particularly being in an academic environment and even from the perspective of trying to push a technology forward, um, you know, getting your filings finished and getting that moving forward, um, so you can talk about it is, is important. We do need to be able to communicate. Um, 
ideas and specific concepts related to the actual manufacturing and commercialization is probably something that he would want to talk less with colleagues, but it tends to be a, a less scientific or academic topic. So I think you can balance academic freedom and commercialization. And as we mentioned, I mean, this is not your first company. You first uh, started with a different company, which was Cartelix, uh, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And before starting that venture, did you want to become an entrepreneur? Well, I often say that um, um, I grew up that way uh, because I did my PhD in uh, Bob Langer's laboratory. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, so, you know, when you grow up and you're surrounded by that, um, you know, it definitely is a real possibility. But I think um, personally for me, it's also the concept of you know, doing the research for a purpose. Right, so um, I don't want to write on the introductory paragraph on my NIH grants that um, you know, we're doing this research, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and make a laundry list and never actually do anything that could actually impact people. And um, it's a little bit tricky because you can imagine continuing on research and perfecting it for a very long time and saying it's not quite ready for people. But particularly when you're in a hospital environment, like um, we are at Johns Hopkins, you really are exposed to patients who need something today. Mm -hmm. or, even, you know, even if it's not tomorrow. perfect. <laughs> right. And, and so even if it's not perfect, you can still really help somebody. So while we might not have you know, the, the super fancy tissue with embryonic stem cells and all, you know, all the bells and whistle, uh, whistles, you can make an impact. Also, as we've done this, it's also brought to light the concept that a lot of the times we're designing in the laboratory a little too far from the real world mm -hmm. and the design parameters that actually make a difference in therapeutic outcome are not always what we thought in the laboratory. And so perhaps, actually the experience is really helpful in doing a better job. And perhaps making things in the lab that are actually too complicated sometimes. Yes. Or yes. Real world. Although yes. they look, they look great on paper, <laughs> but yeah. Right. Um, and you mentioned you mentioned Bob Langer's lab in your upswing as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, in general, how influential was the environment you were in? For example, at Johns Hopkins, uh, are there any key facilities, procedures, or initiatives to simplify, for example, the process of creating a company? Um, I would say at the beginning when we started the first company, it was quite challenging and definitely not, not necessarily um, supported very much. Um, but over time, the perspective has really changed and um, the need for translational research and having a clinical impact has really um, transformed at Johns Hopkins. So um, while it still may be a little challenging to navigate the, the various um, um, pathways to, to do that, I would say there's been a real transformation as far as the perspective of the university and wanting to see translation happen. So it's nice. It's nice to see. What is, in general, the main change in mindset that starting your own company brought to you? Well, I would say, especially early for the first one, but really each new company, um, there's a lot to learn. And, you know, being a... Um, in the personalities that we are interested in science and learning, um, it, it's it's fun because you're always learning. There's always something new. There's always a challenge um, <clears throat> that has to be solved. So um, I would say that's an exciting part of it. Um, I think similar to what you mentioned before, understanding the challenges of taking something that you think you've you know, made all the proof of concept and done everything that needs to be done to translate it, thinking you've done it all in the lab, where there's, there's a lot more beyond that to actually get it, not only into people, but to really widespread use. There are a lot of... Not to mention it takes a while. Yes, yes, there's the time, there's the time component, but um, th there's a, we like to think that science the, is the most important thing, right? Um, and the science and engineering, while of course we like it very much, is really a small component of the whole process of getting something that you have to have the solid foundation and good science, that's for sure. But having the best science doesn't always mean that you're going to have the best impact 
sure. when something goes out. So that's definitely a different mindset. And what kind of advice would you give to someone with a good idea uh, who wants to commercialize it? Or, for example, you know, what would you have done differently? Well, as far as general advice, I would say um, getting out and meeting and talking to a lot of people who've done it before and start um, you know, gathering your information to, to understand the different pathways you can take to do it. Because there are a lot of different ways you can do it based on you know, how much you're involved. Um, are you doing a small company or a larger company? But, you know, just the, there are a lot of different ways that you can move it forward. Um, so so that's, that's something to consider. And I would also say each technology or each company is going to be different in the translation process. Whether it be differences in the IP and the landscape, differences in manufacturing, differences in clinical trial and regulatory aspects and, and marketing, you know, they're all, they're all different. Um, so you, you, there's not a one size fits all um, for that translation process. So um, get as much information as you can, um, try to work with, um, you know, people you respect and there's a, you know, the team that's involved is really important too. One of the previous uh, scientists that we've interviewed for this series mentioned, get a good lawyer. Would you agree with that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you have to be careful because it can be very expensive. So again, um, there are multiple mechanisms of how to do that. But yes, um, I definitely did not appreciate that as much as I should have at the beginning. <laughs> How has this changed your interaction with other scientists? Because usually, I mean, scientists like to give things away for free, more or less. Well, I would say, um, you know, in a laboratory environment, that we still give things away for free. We still talk about stuff. Um, and yeah, I don't like looking at a startup company as another research enterprise in which case people might start being secretive, um, especially secretive. I think the company is really, should be used for um, manufacturing and commercialization. And most, if not all the science, as much as possible should be done before you reach that point um, of starting the company. And I think that helps in many ways. You not only de-risk the technology and have better value when you move it out, uh, but you avoid some of those challenges that um, are you know, rather unacademic. How important do you think that being an entrepreneur is in today's academic world? I, I would say it depends where you are. Um, there are some universities where it's really just an, an add-on and it's not going to be a part of your tenure process or, or um, um, anything like that. So. Um, but however, many funding agencies and you know, around the country, they want to see an impact of what you're doing. And I think it can be very difficult for a field as a whole if there are not a few good examples of a positive impact yeah. on society. Yeah. And I think it's also really important, for, similar to what I mentioned before, that um, a lot of times we're wasting money or designing particularly engineering laboratories or, or applied research laboratories, you could be really using the wrong design parameters that are not relevant in the clinic. So the sooner that that can be figured out and you can start doing um, you know, more relevant yeah, research. The learning curve becomes much yeah. faster. Yeah, so I think it's, um, you do better research if you have that experience and understand what's important in the real world. Um, so now, no matter how well you can model things in the laboratory, outside in the real world is always gonna be a little different. In general terms, why did you decide that you have to remain also an academic scientist in science, as opposed to dedicate yourself full time to startups? Um, well, I guess I love the freedom of the university and academic research. Um, on one hand, it's not fully free because you have to raise the money for what you do. Of course. But, um, you know, as long as you can really argue and justify your idea and, and um, you know, you, ha you have a lot of freedom to try different things. Um, it's also, I, I like being at the university environment um, with always 
you know, new students and new fellows coming through. So um, I, I like that environment and you can, over time, change your involvement in various things. And also perhaps, I mean, what I would be guessing is that uh, at a university, you always have an income of um, ideas yeah. uh, coming in that, that yeah. can, you can cross pollinate. And perhaps create new. Yeah, you can almost look at the research laboratory as an incubator. Mm -hmm. And what floats the top and has a commercial relevance can then be spun out. And I mean, all these things are obviously very time consuming. So how do you juggle your time between your academic career and your company? Um, well, you know, that's a challenge of time management, even if you're just an academic or just, just an entrepreneur, right? It's, there's always going to be time management issues. And um, I often read those same articles that I'm sure everyone else does about how to be more efficient in your time <laughs> management. So, you yeah. know, balancing work and family, whether it be academics and entrepreneur and all of that, it's, it's, um, it's always going to be a challenge. And at different times, it's going to have different challenges and you just got to go with it and make, make those decisions about prioritizing. And I mean, we, we talked briefly about the fact that uh, you think that most of the research should be done in the lab before uh, creating the company. But I mean, some of, some research will have to be done, uh, I would say, refining uh, the things that you get out from the lab for commercialization. Um, and so, I mean, you're going to have some researchers um, at a company that work on the, on the development or the final development of the devices that you're going to, you're going to commercialize. Um, do you feel that it's important for scientists at a startup to still publish in the open scientific literature? Um, I would say um, it really depends on the type of technology, at least for the technologies that I'm involved with, with biomaterials and medical devices. Um, I personally would like to see more development going on in the company related to manufacturing and, you know, figuring out design parameters, um, um, release testing parameters. So. I wouldn't want to see too much new science being done mm -hmm. in the company per se, but you're going to have to do, you know, some characterization to make sure things are, you know, similar to what was originally designed, even with manufacturing changes. Um, but I'd like to see, um, you know, companies really focus on what companies should be good, you know, good at, um, which is really that translation process. So I, I'd like to see that kind of development, you know, applied research development going on in the company. So I think, um, you know, particularly with clinical trials, that's important to get out. Um, I doubt that much manufacturing, first of all, you probably don't want that know-how out into the community. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't see quite as much potential for publications as with let's say, the outcomes of clinical, clinical testing. Um, and with this, we are ending our uh, uh, interview. This was great. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for taking Thank time you. to this schedule. And thanks to all our viewers. And see you at our next installment of our series of interviews about scientists and entrepreneurs in material science.